As I walk with beauty, the universe is walking with me. In beauty, it walks before me. In beauty, it walks behind me. In beauty, it walks below me. In beauty, it walks above me. Beauty is on every side. As I walk, I walk with beauty. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Westside Congregation. I'm Carol Eaglehart, and leading the service with me this morning is Laurel Anderson. And we want to thank all who are participating in our service, our greeters, our Graham Cast Tech and Roxy Cast Tech. Our sound master is Dana Sanford, and Steve Poyani is shooting our video. So, is anybody here a first time visitor? First time? No? Okay. We're all here. We're all family, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And welcome to those of you who are seeing this on video. Um, okay, I've got a big question for you all. What happens next Sunday, January 16th? Something really important. Annual meeting. Annual meeting. Annual meeting. Yes, the yes. annual meeting of the UU Westside Congregation. Uh, this is a big thing. This is the day we do our election. And as a member of the nominating committee, I can tell you that we have a really good slate of people willing to serve. And what we really need is for everybody to be here because we need a quorum. So put it on your calendars and make sure that you're here. Um, we're going to have our regular Sunday service and then a potluck lunch and then the meeting. So don't miss it. Uh, another announcement is that after the service today at 1230, the program committee is going to meet. So if you have ideas or you want to participate, come to the meeting. Karen also has an announcement for us. Come on up here, Karen. Good morning, and thank you for giving me this moment. I just want to talk about Feed Rio and your kids for a second or two. Um, a week from today, we will, uh, no, wrong. <laughs> On Tuesday the 18th, we will, doing, we will doing, we'll be doing assembly of packets here. So if you have any food that you can bring, I hope you will bring it next Sunday. I also want to give you a very brief report. Uh, I'll put the whole report up on that door back there. But in the uh, year so far, meaning ending in December 31st, um, we have supplied 820 weekend packets at a cost of approximately $7,380. So I just want you to know that we are making a difference in the lives of many children in Rio Rancho, and your support means a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We have another announcement, which is um, on Saturday the 15th at noon, if you meet here in the parking lot, you can be part of the first, maybe first annual, <laughs> UUWC walk. Teresa has, is willing to lead us on a walk through the Bosque. So that's Saturday morning at noon. Meet here if you would like to go on a UUWC walk. So any other announcements? Yes, Michelle. We are going to the MLK meeting at 4 o'clock next Sunday. At service. Community service. service for Martin Luther King Day next Sunday at 4 o'clock. And what's really bad is I cannot tell you where because I don't remember the name of the place. But I will I email remember. it to you all. Okay. And next Sunday morning, it's in Rio Rancho. Yes. And it is a, an assortment of the faith communities in Rio Rancho that gather together to do this. So watch for the email and you'll find out all the details. So um, today our service is on mindfulness. And if, we're, if you're afraid that we're just going to sit here all morning and meditate and chant OM, don't worry. Okay? Uh, meditation is only one way to be mindful. Mindfulness is the ability to be present and aware. So we'll be exploring how we can do that. So to begin, please stand as you're able for the lighting of our chalice, and let's read the words in unison.
We light this chalice as a symbol of the light of the love that burns brightly in the darkness and brings us compassion and hope. Each week as a congregation, we also affirm our aspirations. Let's speak them together. Life is a gift. We gather in community to celebrate the glories and the mysteries of this great gift. In the light of truth and in the warmth of love, we gather to seek, to sustain, and to share. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth is our sacrament, and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community, to the end that all souls grow into harmony with the creation, thus do we covenant with one another. Shalom. And please remain standing, and let's join in one of our favorite songs in the hymn book, Spirit of Life, number 123. <laughs> <laughs> person like me. <laughs> now this dog says, okay, I'll go over the rules one more time. First I bring you the ball, then you say, out, which I think means tug. You try to remove the ball from my mouth while I clench down. Then you repeat, out, Luna, while I completely fail to understand you and maybe also let out a few playful growls. <laughs> then you say, Luna, let go, while I wag my tail because I heard my name. <laughs> Finally, after you give up and let go, I make sure the ball is drenched in slobber and then drop it in your lap, <laughs> just to grab it away again when you reach for it. Please try to keep it up. This is an important game that helps us establish pack order. And I can't continue to outrank you if you won't play. <laughs> Mindfulness is a very, very old practice. Like most people, I thought it began with Buddha. But when I sat down at the computer and Googled the history of mindfulness, I was surprised to learn that there were references to mindfulness and its practice in ancient Hindu writings long before Buddha was even alive. These ancient history, ancient Hindu writers talk about what can be called the path, path of rightness, a path to the Hindu supreme spiritual source, Brahman. So how do you find that path? You find it through sustain, sus, sustained attention. 
One way to get that sustained attention is through the practice of yoga. It was thought that mindful breathing, which is a fundamental aspect of yoga, empowers the body and mind to connect with the divine. So that was the Hindu perspective. Remember, the Hindu religion can be traced back over 4,000 years ago. Then along came Buddha. Buddhism is much more recent than Hindu religion. It traces its origin somewhere between 400 and 500 BC at the birth of Siddhartha, who later became known as Buddha. He was born somewhere in northern India or Nepal. Now get this, his parents were Hindu, so they brought him up as a Hindu. So he was familiar with the ancient Hindu concepts and yoga. And when he became enlightened, he talked about the seven factors of enlightenment, elements that you must have to become enlightened. The first element, the first factor is mindfulness. It's possible that meditation may have been the original core practice of the Buddha, which aided the maintenance of mindfulness. The first step was the act of bringing your attention and awareness to the present. As things developed, you can see a difference emerging in the mind, what mindfulness meant for the Buddhist and for the Hindus. Basically, it was a difference in purpose. For Buddhist, mindfulness meant rising above thoughts and emotions so that you could understand the true nature of reality. On the other hand, for Hindus, it was more about focusing the mind so you can be fully absorbed in the union with the divine. So when do we start hearing about mindfulness in our Western world? Not until the 19th century, when a scholar named Thomas William Rise Davis, uh, in his translation of the Buddhist literature, he used the word mindfulness as a synonym for attention. How and when did mindfulness get transferred to the United States? That wasn't until the 1970s. John Kabat-Zinn was studying for his PhD in molecular biology at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He heard a lecture by a Buddhist missionary. He was so fascinated that he went on to study meditation under several other Buddhists, including Thich Nhat Hanh. In 1979, Kabat-Zinn founded what he called the Mindfulness based stress reduction clinic at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. It was very, it was way too hard to keep saying mindfulness, stress, mindful based stress reduction, I can't even say it. So it became known as MBSR. So what happened at the MBSR? There was an eight week course of treatment that was a combination of meditation, yoga, body awareness, and explorations of patterns of behavior and feelings. The goal was to help participants to become aware of thoughts and feelings, both positive and negative, and to rid themselves of damaging behaviors by breaking the negative cycles of their life and finding clarity. What happened was mindfulness became removed from any religious overtones. What's interesting to me is that Kabat-Zinn talked about our UU ancestry, ancestors. He referred to Henry David Thoreau as a predecessor of the interest in mindfulness. He also referred to other eminent transcendentalists such as Emerson and Whitman. So mindfulness has some UU roots. Yay. Kabat Zen <laughs> and the MBSR stimulate, stimulated the secular interest in mindfulness practices in the West. Today, mindfulness practices can be found not only in medical programs, but businesses, schools, prisons, government. The popularization of mindfulness is extended to all areas. There are more than six thousand books published today with the word mindfulness in the title. And even my watch, believe it or not, has an app for mindfulness. It, it bings to me and says, this is the time to take time out for mindfulness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 
it's all over, all over the place. With the popularization of mindfulness, there began to be research to study the effect of mindful practices. Some scientists observed that increased mindfulness was associated with less anxiety. There were even studies on elementary school age children, and they found that kids who completed mindfulness programs displayed fewer attention problems. I actually observed this in my own teaching. Several years ago, I had a little boy, a five-year-old named Diego. And Diego was a very active boy and one of the most popular in the class. One day on the playground, he was playing chase with his buds, going up and down the slide and the climbing thing, and suddenly Diego shot off, went to a nearby tree, sat down, and started meditating. Well, the other children noticed that Diego wasn't with them anymore and followed him. I stood between the two of them and said we would talk about this after recess. After recess, I asked Diego if he would explain to the children what he was doing, and he did. And the children became interested. I went to the library and found a book on yoga for kids and introduced my class to yoga. We tried several poses, and they really enjoyed it. So after that, when we went to circle, if they were particularly wiggly, I would, I would have them go to their space in the classroom, stick out their hands so they had plenty of room, and we would do three or four poses from the book. When the class came back to the circle, they were quiet, they were focused, and we got a lot more work done. It was amazing. Mindfulness is not just about yoga and meditation. Christians can be said to practice mindfulness as they pray. And Jewish mindfulness practices including the, includes the Friday practice of lighting the candles and saying the prayers. It's about attention and it's about awareness. And it's about being fully present. To show you this, I'm going to show you, we're going to, we, I'm going to show you, and then you're going to do with me a mindful practice that can be done by anybody from one to a hundred. Very simple way to, con to concentrate on your breath, which we said earlier was the basic of yoga. So I'm going to ask you to raise your left hand. Take your, point your finger from your right hand, and you're going to put it on your thumb. We're going to trace our hand, and when we go down, we're going to breathe in. When we go up, we're going to let that breath out. Down. It's a simple little exercise that makes you fully present and calm. So today, for our moment for centering, we're going to practice focusing on our breathing. And you can trace your fingers like Laurel just taught us, or you can simply close your eyes or softly focus them, and, and then concentrate on your breath and about breathing in and breathing out deeply. And I'll play some music that will help you to help time your breaths so that it's not rapid, that you can slow them down. So, moment for symmetry.
recipe. One of our traditions is to take time in our Sunday service to lift up our joys and concerns and light a candle for each one. So if you have a joy or a concern, raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone and uh, Laurel will light a candle for each one. nephew's first birthday and the day after the party his parents reported that they were both positive for COVID oh. Oh. and it being Texas and all we were the only ones wearing masks um, and we had taken the great nephew to our um, B&B with us for the night and so we ended up keeping him for several days and when we got home we all tested negative found out that my, my sister's granddaughter, who was three years old, is currently going through another of many rounds of chemotherapy treatments for leukemia, and she needs lots of prayers. Thank you, Donna. Anyone else? Okay. Wait. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm uh, very happy to say that I had my second cataract surgery, and Janet is right. The colors are vibrant, uh, especially the ones on the tree, the red bulbs. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. Oh, here. Yeah, actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm joyful for the service today. I came in with my head full of things, and uh, it's really nice to be be able to relax a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you, Carol. Yeah. Great. Right. Who else? Oh, I see Harmon up here. Today is our, our wedding anniversary. We don't know how many years we've been married. We remember the day, but not the year. <laughs> Anybody else? Carol, can I? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I have a joy and a concern. The joy was the joy is I'm back, and I had an amazing vacation. Did, did everything on our very complicated list, visited five museums, went to a Broadway show, saw family on both sides, which was so wonderful after the COVID. We had a good, safe time uh, with family, and I saw a friend who I had not seen for 40 years, so it was an amazing vacation, and I'm glad to be back, and I'm glad to tell you that I had a COVID test yesterday, and I'm negative. Yes! <laughs> My concern, however, is that my sister-in-law, with whom we stay, my husband's sister, uh, when, when we got there within the first couple days, the bed broke, her, her dryer broke, her refrigerator broke, and we just got a phone call. Her heater died. So she is in Baltimore, 24-degree temperature, using space heaters. So she needs some thoughts, prayers, or something. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, Melinda. <laughs> On the heels of 
Laurel's announcement about her poor sister-in-law. We had a plumbing emergency yesterday, and the faucet on the outside of our house in the backyard started spraying water, and I just noticed it, but a huge area of the side of the wall is soaking wet, chunks of stucco falling off, Whoa. the wall is bowing, oh. so we're facing a lot of repairs. <laughs> I have a joy. Uh, I had a wonderful holiday visit with my new sweetie, Catherine, and she was supposed to fly out on Wednesday, and doggone it, her flights were canceled. So, <laughs> <laughs> an extra day, so I'm grateful. <laughs> we'll light one more candle for those joys and concerns that we hold silently in our hearts. And we will light our red candle for the victims of racial violence. Maybe we become aware, perceptive, pay attention, and help them with understanding and love. As it be. Like this one, this will be. No, actually, I want to use yes, this one. Use that one. <laughs> okay. Now, we're going to do another mindfulness uh, uh, thing. And um, I think, Ada, Ada, you're going to love this one because it has glitter. And let me tell you, I'm not big on glitter. Actually, it was the one thing I didn't like using as a teacher. But this is really cool because the snow. A globe or a glitter jar, which we're going to make, is the most powerful visual metaphor for the connection between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. It illustrates how mindfulness affects us and how we're going. Now we're going to make that glitter jar. I'm going to grab this. Okay, I'll put it back. <laughs> okay, I have my glitter jar. This is our mind. It is nice and clear right now, isn't it? But our minds aren't totally clear. We have, and I'll use the red glitter, we have thoughts. Come on, the glitter. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it yet because it's yep. sitting at the top, but I'm putting in a lot of red glitter. So that's our thoughts. Yep. And you can see it as they come down, you'll see. We have feelings. So I use the gold in our mind. And we have urges to act, and that's going to be silver. Now, at the moment, our mind is pretty still. We're going to show you, we're going to go through a day. I'm going to put a top on this. At the mo moment, our mind is still. There's not a lot of, well, you can see the glitter is coming down if you look real carefully. But we're going to wake up. The alarm is going to go off. And pretty soon, our mind starts working. And some of the colors are coming down. Well, then we go downstairs. And our sister, our big sister, has eaten all the pancakes. <laughs> oh boy, our mind is going. <laughs> and it's coming down. And then we get in the car to go to school, and Mama has the radio on, and they're talking about COVID again. And our mind gets stirred up again. And then we get to school. And we're still coming, these are still going through our mind, the pancakes, the news. And the teacher passes the math test back, and you got 100. Whoa! <laughs> that mind goes, and all those thoughts, feelings, and urges are just going in our mind. And it's just a rush. We can't be still. How do we quiet ourselves down so we can concentrate at school? What do we have to do? Breathe. Breathe. Be still. So we're going to have the jar be still. And what happens when we are being still? All those 
little glitters are going to the bottom and our mind is clearing. It's now the water is becoming clear, just like our mind. Because as we're being still, all the thoughts, the feelings, and the urges are quieting down with us. Once we're quieted down, we notice the glitter hasn't gone away. We have not lost our thoughts, our feelings, or our urges. They have just settled quietly. They will be there. And I am sure they'll come back like a whirlwind. <laughs> when things become clear, we can proceed and go on quietly with whatever we have to do. That some people call wisdom. When we so the finished glitter jar can remind us. One of the things we could do with the glitter jar is that when we get upset, we can turn our glitter jar over again. When our mind is like our glitter jar, we can put it down and breathe. until the glitter settles and our mind settles. So you can try this at home. <laughs> now, oh, okay. and, hey, thank you. Well, that was fun to play with. <laughs> I found a song on YouTube about mindfulness. And it's a children's song. I go look it up later because she sings it. Charity Kahn sings it with a bunch of children dancing around. But really, it's a song for all ages. And the words are in your program. So let's try this together. May I be happy. May I be well. May I be safe and sound. May I be peaceful. May I be at ease with love in my heart and all around. Let's try it. May I be happy. May I be well. May I be safe and sound. May I be peaceful. May I be at ease with love in my heart and all around. We want to say, may you be happy. So we're sending this out. Okay, here we go. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe and sound. May you be peaceful. May you be at ease with love in your heart and all around. So now let's sing it for all of us. May we be happy. May we be happy. Laurel will bring the basket to you if you didn't get a chance to put your offering in. Right. Well, we have a little song that we usually sing with this, and let's do it. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. And now we're going to practice. Are you ready to practice? Yes. Okay. So one way to practice mindfulness is to move our bodies and be aware of each motion. Now don't freak out, we're not dancing here. <laughs> I know how some of you feel about dancing, but we're going to do these motions um, right there in where you are in the pew, okay? So, um, and I'll play some music and we're these motions that we make to it. So imagine that there's light and love and beauty all around us. 
and that it's there for us if we open to it and just reach out for it. So first we'll reach out with one hand and very slowly gather it up and bring it to our heart. And then we'll reach out with the other hand and very slowly bring that love and light to our hearts. And then we'll reach up to the whole universe of light and then very slowly bring it down, down, down into our very being. And that's how we'll do for this whole song. So feel yourself getting into mindfulness as we do. It's primarily used to inject a little mindful experience throughout your day when you need it most. Even after a good mindfulness meditation in the morning, it's easy, easy today to quickly get caught up in the stresses and activity of your daily life. 
By implying mindfulness to these experiences during your day, your mind will be on autopilot less, and you will be able to check in with how you are feeling, what you are thinking, and what behavior you're engaging in. The STOP acronym stands for, S is for STOP. Whatever you're doing, just pause momentarily. T, take a breath. Reconnect with your breath. The breath is the anchor to the present moment. O, observe. Notice what's happening inside and outside. Where has your mind go gone? What do you feel? What are you doing? P, proceed. Continue with what you were doing. Or don't. Use the information gained to, during the check-in to change course. Whatever you do, do it mindfully. Now, you can do anything mindfully. Anything. And when I Googled it, I found all sorts of things. But I, one thing I found that was fascinating was that you can be mindful doing chores. So we're going to do a little exercise now. Everybody in here, I assume, eats and therefore has some dish to wash. And so therefore, we are going to try to be mindful while we wash dishes. Let your inner child come out because we're going to pantomime this. And join me with join me washing a plate. Turn on your water and watch it come down. Is it warm? Is it cool? Add some detergent. What does it smell like? What does it look like? Mine's dawn. It's blue. What color is yours? Can you pick up the plate now? Feel the grit on the plate the, from your meal, whatever you had, the eggs or the whatever it was. Feel the grit, but the smooth part on the edges. And then we're going to put that plate into the water, and you can feel the water. Is it hot? Is it cool? Is it smooth? You can feel the bubbles from your, from your detergent. And you take, grab a sponge, and we're going to wash that plate. And you can feel the sponge. You can hear the splashing of the water because you're kind of doing it underwater. And watch the soap bubbles. When you think it's nice and clean, let's turn the water on again. And let's rinse our plate. Again, we're feeling for the water. What does it feel like? We're listening to the water gurgling down. And then we're going to put the, pl the plate into the rack, and you are finished. Your plate is clean. Now you can go home and do that. Is that fun? <laughs> <laughs> so mindfulness it doesn't just mean sitting still and meditating for eight hours a day. For some people, that actually increases their anxiety. For me, I think I would get a leg cramp. But the idea is everything in moderation. So by now, you see that there's many ways to practice mindfulness. Uh, one we haven't mentioned yet is journaling. How many people keep a journal? We've got people, yeah. Journaling is a mindfulness activity. When you keep a journal, you're focusing on what you're thinking and feeling. Now, another way to practice mindfulness is by what they call a body scan. Now, now, what does that mean? What you do is you close your eyes and you breathe deeply, and then you start at the top of your head and just scan down your body so that if your jaw is tense, you, then you, you deliberately relax your jaw. Uh, if you find that your shoulders are all tensed up, then you deliberately relax your shoulders. If you find that your, your hands and your fingers are kind of tense, then you deliberately relax them. So you're scanning your whole body all the way down. You notice your feet against the floor. So it's a way to calm your mind during the day and relax yourself when you're going to sleep at night. Now, another mindfulness practice is simply stretching. You raise your hands over your head, grab your wrist, and you can do this right now. Yeah, and then kind of tilt to one side, stretch, and tilt to the other side, and stretch. Yeah. You don't need to, you know, take a yoga pose. 
or, or do anything fancy, you stand on your head, no. Just simply beware of your, um, be aware of your body and stretch and see how it feels. Another mindfulness practice is photography. Yes, photography. <laughs> it used to be that you had to worry about f-stops and apertures and you had to get just the right lens. Uh, the smartphone has done away with all this, right? Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's easy to take a photo now. And one of the things that you're doing is you're paying attention. You're seeing what you're really, really looking at something. And you're freezing it for a moment in time. And then there's mindfulness in eating. Now, when you came in today, you received a little box of raisins. Is there anybody who didn't get a little box of raisins? more. Are you ready to try eating mindfully? What we're going to do is take one raisin out of the box. Don't eat it yet. Just get out one raisin. Now look very carefully at your raisin. Now, you know how when you take a walk with a little child, they'll stop and they'll pick up a rock and they really, really look at it. So look at your raisin that same way. Really, really look at it. Become aware of the color of the raisin and all those little wrinkly crevices inside. And now feel it with your fingers. You're not looking at it now. You're just kind of feeling it. Roll it gently between your fingers and feel that texture. Become fully aware of the feel of the raisin. Got that? Now you're going to put the raisin in your mouth, but don't chop down on it. <laughs> okay? Roll it around with your tongue. Become aware of how it feels on your tongue. Maybe touch it with the tip of your tongue. And then roll it to the side of your mouth and see how it feels with the side of your tongue. Try it under your tongue. And then press it against the roof of your mouth. Very, very gently bite down on your raisin. Very gently become aware of the taste. Now the outside of the raisin may taste a little bit bitter at first. So bite down a little harder and become aware of how the taste changes to sweet. And see what it's like to chew your raisin very, very slowly. This is what it's like to eat mindfully, paying close attention. Imagine doing this with your whole meal. What would that be like to have an intense awareness of the food that you eat? So, how did that feel? How did any of this feel? I'll grab the mic and I'll bring it to you. Wave your hand. Yes, Melinda. been a wonderful reminder of things I'm sure many of us have encountered before, and I highly recommend Thich Nhat Hanh's, the first book I was introduced to, Peace is Every Step, and in it there is the dishwashing, and he says something like, when you are washing the dishes, just be washing the dishes. Don't be looking at the yard that needs mowing out your window. Don't be thinking about the PTA meeting later today. Just wash the dishes. <laughs> Thank you, Melinda. Anybody else? Yeah, Kathy. In Victorian England, there was a diet fad 
they said you had to chew every mouthful of food 40 times. Oh, my God. And so people would sit around and chew every mouthful of food 40 times. So dinner would take like three hours. <laughs> and people did lose weight because dinner took three hours. You know? <laughs> I don't think it had anything to do with mindfulness, though. <laughs> Digestion, maybe. Anybody else? Yeah, Brown. My cat likes to plop on the floor and have me massage him. And when I do that, I think we both have mindfulness. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Another wonderful thing of the animals in our life. Anybody else? Oh, um, yeah, our way. I'm going to go a little against the grain. I was really anxious. I wanted to eat the reason. <laughs> and I kept thinking, I did, I did. But once I realized what I was doing, I was able to let go of it, but I had to pay attention to my own anxiety to make it happen, to sit back and wait. So thank you. Yeah, Donna. So I recently had a crisis where one of my cats became extremely ill and I was really afraid that I was going to lose her. But fortunately she recovered, she made a complete recovery and this cat loves to climb into my arms and purr and I, you know, being faced with the possibility of losing her i become much more mindful of the softness of her fur, the colors in her fur, especially as she regained her health and her fur went from kind of being rough and ratty to soft and bright again. And, yeah. Thank you, Donna. Anybody got any mindfulness practices that they do that we haven't mentioned here yet that you want to share with people? All right, yeah. When I first um, began practicing meditation, I'm not a very still person. And I learned that for me, walking was the very best meditation in the world. So if you don't like sitting still, put a thought in your head, step outside, and then just watch nature, <coughs> and with nature while we're outside. And some of you may remember that last year I did a whole service on video on walking meditation. So uh, there's still directions to that well, those walks, and you can go check that out again. Oh, I see Bram. I like to walk with my headphones on, and my mind just calms down and goes everywhere. I become very mindful when I go outside at three or four in the morning and look at the stars and constellations and the crescent moon or the half moon. And it makes me feel very whole without a word. And it makes you feel like you belong. You feel like you belong. I love it. And um, one more comment here. Another thing Thich Nhat Hanh recommended, for those of us who have chattery minds and they're always talking and you can't get the words to go away, when you do the breathing in and breathing out, he has you think things like, I am breathing in peace, I am breathing out stress. And so you have words that occupy you, but it still helps you be mindful. Right. Calm that busy mind. <laughs> Well, there's a song that I wrote many years ago, and uh, it's in your program. So let's close with singing it together. It's called, May All Be Well. It goes like this. May all be well.
with love this day. May all be well. May all be blessed with health this day. May all be well. May all be well. May all be blessed with health this day. May all be well. May all be well. gently through the world and know its beauty all the days of your life. Blessed be. Let's join in our glow now in peace song. They face the center and sing to each other. Go. Go. 